Morning, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Today, I'm talking about depression linked to neurotransmitters. I started this yesterday. Um, we had some technical issues, so I'm doing it today. And we're going to circle back through the topic of depression. Uh, I want the overview to make sense. And then we're going to deep, we're going to deep dive down more into glutamate metabolism today. So I'm going to hide this. None of this is intended as medical advice. Go ahead and pause the video, read the disclaimer. Okay. I'm going to bring this diagram in. Uh, so I use this diagram in a traumatic brain injury broadcast uh, a while ago. I'm using it here to relay the information regarding the memory area and its importance in depression. So we know a lot about depression at this point in time. Uh, we know that antidepressants work for a lot of people. We also know that there's a, a lot of people who have depression uh, where they have treatment resistant depression. Estimates vary, maybe 30%, maybe 50%. Nonetheless, depression is the world leading cause of disability. And so that's a very, very important point. What we know regarding the biology of the depression of depression is that uh, the fear center takes over and the fear center becomes dominant in the brain. It actually enlarges proportionally, signaling to the front part of the brain where we produce hormones that talk to our adrenal glands that produce more hormones like cortisol. And the cortisol then feeds back and for all intents and purposes, it will cause the memory area to shrink. So, the reason why I want you to look at this diagram is that you can see this hippocampus. It kind of looks like a worm. And the hippocampus is such an important area in the brain because it's one area where we make new brain cells all the time. The other is where we smell in the olfactory bulb. So this anatomical relationship between the fear center and the memory area is so important to depression. <clears throat> depression is very multifactorial. Uh, there can be a number of things that bring it on. Um, also, it's important to clarify that depression, clinical depression, is, is a state where someone's been depressed consistently for a long period of time, at least two weeks was the DSM-4 uh, categorization. But you need to be depressed for quite some period of time. Uh, it's not just feeling sad because maybe a, a major life event happened. It's a consistent uh, physiologic state, mental state where someone is not feeling happy. They may not have pleasure. Their sleep is often disturbed, they're gaining weight, they're losing weight, getting off the couch or getting up to do anything just seems like a monumental task. Um, they may have you know, thoughts that uh, are not good directed at themselves. So it's a very, very serious condition. And that's why anybody with depression needs to be followed by a doctor. And to get to that point where these symptoms are consistent and they're not going away and someone's sleep is disturbed and their fatigue, we have to realize that more is going on in the brain than just someone not being motivated or someone uh, needing to be stronger. <clears throat> it's not like that. Now, relative to antidepressants, because we're talking about neurotransmitters, antidepressants um, basically kind of came on the scene when uh, doctors and researchers were noticing that blood pressure medications were having effects on depression, which then led to the discovery of the monoamine oxidase enzyme and how changing that enzyme affects your neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. These are monoamines. And what doctors started seeing is that if they put people on medications, which may block, uh, a neurotransmitter like serotonin from being broken down or basically keep more serotonin in between your brain cells that a lot of people had remissions of their depression. They felt significantly better and it was wonderful. As I mentioned in the prelude, more and more people are having treatment resistant depression. So this model seems to work for some people. It doesn't work for everyone. There are newer classes of antidepressants um, that, you know, some have pretty good efficacy. And with all that being said, um, if it was just a chemical issue, taking an antidepressant should fix the problem for most people. 
and it should fix it right away if it's just a chemical problem. What we now know is that these antidepressants take weeks to sometimes over a month to work. And the way they're working is that they're growing new brain cells in the memory area is one of the key ways we're finding that they work. And I'm gonna to talk today a lot about glutamate uh, because glutamate is a different pathway, so to speak, that can be used to potentially grow new neuronal connections uh, in the frontal areas. So uh, your neurons have these dendrites as it's termed, so that's how they connect. And so these dendrites, can start to wither in the depression process. And this glutamate mechanism seems to be encouraging that it may foster more neuronal growth in the, not neuronal growth, in the frontal lobes. They may foster more dendritic connections in the frontal lobes and more neuronal growth in the memory area. So I read an article this morning, uh, looking at, like I should say, uh, and the researchers found that depression has gone up during this pandemic uh, quite a lot. So this last two years has been very stressful. That's why um, that's why it's important to talk about this right now. And that's why I'm trying to do another depression series, because I think so many of us need, uh, you know, kind of a reset and kind of a, a refresher, so to speak, maybe a good way to say it. Uh, major depressive disorder is the most prominent mental health disorder. Um, it is a prominent mental health disorder. I'll say it that way. Uh, it's not 300 million people in the United States. That's a, a typo. It's between 20 and 30 million people in the United States, depending on who you talk to. But again, coming out of the pandemic, it seems that depression is even more common uh, at this point in time. Uh, women are two times as likely as men to experience depression, it's difficult to treat, and some people respond really well, others don't. And we have to look at genetics. I talked about MTHFR last week, which is your ability to take folic acid and make it active. Um, neurobiology, hormones, environmental factors, all can contribute to depression, including trauma, particularly earlier in life. <clears throat> okay. So what is glutamate? Glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter of your brain. So glutamate is very, very important for your brain to work. And glutamate, what we're finding is that when we're under chronic stress, glutamate signaling becomes disturbed. So when we're under this chronic stress, the stress seems to affect our glutamate function such that neurons don't signal glutamate as well. <clears throat> and it's thought by using certain agents, some are pharmaceutical, some are natural, that can bind to glutamate receptors that may serve as a glutamate restart, and it kind of jump starts the brain. And these glutamate mechanisms seem to have a very powerful effect, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, in allowing more connections, dendritic connections to be specific in the frontal lobes, and they seem to be able to potentially foster new neuronal growth in the memory area. So um, very, very interesting. Also, it's interesting that when we're under chronic stress, glutamate signaling seems to hypertrophy the amygdala. So the chronic stress mechanism is so powerful because it just reinforces all the wrong things. So we're chronically stressed, that amygdala gets bigger. Glutamate signaling helps that amygdala to get bigger. This is part of the addiction process as well uh, that we're, they're finding. So individuals who have addictive traits in their brain, they see very similar findings of chronic stress and depression patterns as we do, you know, depressed patients. And we're seeing that in those who battle addiction. So it's very, very, very interesting. Uh, here's just a little diagram to kind of represent that. If you look at the diagram on the left, you can see the chronic stress slash depression. Uh, it doesn't look as dense with as many connections up here representing dendrites. Uh, you see fewer blue triangles, red circles, whereas on the right-hand side, you see a lot of those. And that is the current postulated mechanism as to why glutamate modulators, we'll say them that way. I don't wanna say antagonists or agonists, but glutamate modulators seem to have quite a bit of potential in helping these neuronal issues in the brain. Here they're looking at ketamine. Uh, that's just one that's being used currently. 
So I think that pretty well does it justice. I will talk about serotonin and other broadcasts, um, but let me know if this makes sense. Let me know any questions you have. Uh, I appreciate you watching. Uh, info at gatesbrainhealth.com is the best way to contact us. And I'll be back probably tomorrow with another broadcast on something more metabolically oriented like muscle activation syndrome. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.